Welcome to the Reintegrate Podcast. My name is Bob Robinson, and my co-host is Brendan Romai. In a society fixated on division, anxiety, and greed, Jesus Christ offers another path. He has told his followers that instead of living by striving, competition, and comparison, that all of us have equal dignity and worth. It's often assumed that the good life is only for the most wealthy, attractive, and powerful. Poor, sad, and suffering people are left out. But Jesus offers a ninefold path in the Beatitudes that is for everyone. Whatever your story, whatever your struggle, wherever you find yourself, Jesus says that you are blessed in him. Mark Scandret is the founding director of Reimagine, a center for integral Christian practice, where he leads retreats and workshops and projects that help participants apply spiritual wisdom to everyday life. His latest book is The Ninefold Path of Jesus, Hidden Wisdom of the Beatitudes, published by InterVarsity Press in 2021. In this book, Mark explores the nine sayings in the opening verses of Matthew chapter 5, helping readers move beyond their first instincts to instead embrace the deeper reality of the kingdom of God. He invites us into nine new postures for life. Instead of living in fear, we can choose radical love. Well, Mark, welcome to the show. To start out, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, things that you've studied, and how you arrived at embracing the Beatitudes of Jesus as a pathway for living? Yeah, so um, I've studied uh, psychology and theology, and I worked as a uh, as a social worker, and then as a pastor, and then as a church planter. And after spending a long time in uh, kind of creating Christian communities, my interest kind of veered specifically towards how do we apply the teachings of Christ to the messy details of life. And uh, Dallas Willard was a big influence. Uh, on me early in my late twenties. Um, so located here in San Francisco, we created kind of a school for living where we'd take people through a, a 12 month process of, of looking at various aspects of the good news of Jesus and then dimensions of life and trying to figure out where the two meet, not just on an intellectual basis, but um, by doing ex- uh, what we call experiments or learning labs together of trying on new practices and taking new risks to uh, discover the wisdom of Jesus' message. For the Beatitudes, uh, I'd written a book in 2011 called Practicing the Way of Jesus, and a Bible agency in uh, London discovered it in about 2015 and asked me to uh, do a retreat for them and then be part of a project that they called Nine Beats, which has been a project oriented around helping people rediscover these life-changing words of of Jesus found at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Uh, particularly in the UK and Central Europe. A lot of young people either feel like uh, Christianity is irrelevant to life or that it's even toxic. And so uh, looking at the Beatitudes, it's all about justice and peacemaking and wholeheartedness and this is a, a message that's not, these are not themes that often are associated with our faith, uh, at least in contemporary life. And so the thought was how do we, that we could, we could help people develop an imagination for the life-giving ways of Jesus using the Beatitudes as a scheme for that. The Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew chapters five through seven, starts with this strange list of who is blessed in the kingdom of God. I think, I think if we're paying attention, it's pretty shocking who gets blessings in these Beatitudes. Yeah, absolutely. We think that we are blessed if we're making a good living and if people think we've made it and if if we're wealthy, if we have influence, if we're a celebrity, that's evidence that we're blessed. But this list, right? Oh my. It's strange to bless people who are persecuted and are poor and who are meek and don't fend for themselves. What do you make of Jesus's countercultural blessings, Mark? Jesus, in with those statements, and the word he used was makarios, means something like highly fortunate or godlike. And you know, we we under I think we understand this term. It's a it's the kind of honorific attitude we would have towards a celebrity, a tech billionaire, um, when they're not doing evil in the world, and. Uh, <laughs> 
or or the most successful person in a, a certain tr- trade or vocation. Yeah. And I think human beings have probably always thought I'm I have suffering and struggle in my, my life, but there are people who live on a a higher level and that's the successful the wealthy the most attractive and so jesus into that uh assumption you know turns the tables and says god is with you or you are you are fortunate um when you know god's life is available to you when you are suffering when you're in struggle when when you're experiencing poverty when you're in mourning um, God's life is present to you. So I like to say it like this, like whatever your story, whatever your struggle, wherever you find yourself right now, God's life can come to you. And I don't know about you, but that's good news to me. Nobody gets left out. Nobody gets left behind. There's a way to wake up and say yes to God's life from wherever you're at, at this moment. You know, we see that the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mark, your book is titled the ninefold path of Jesus. We don't have time for all nine. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I want to get, um, you know, touch on a couple of them just for the benefit of our listeners. The first beatitude is actually one of my personal favorite beatitudes uh, found in Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why is it a blessing to be poor in spirit? Yeah. Uh, Luke says, blessed are the poor. Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, what does it mean to be poor? Poverty is when you don't have enough or you feel like you don't have enough. Something is lacking. And uh, in the book, for each beatitude, I suggest there's a first instinct we go to that's part of human nature or the human condition. And then with these statements, Jesus is inviting us to see it differently, to see ourselves and to see life differently. So, I think our first instinct when we come into a sense of not having enough or not being enough is to close our hands, to grab and grasp, to to live with a sense of anxiety and a desire to control. And I'm squeezing my hands right now and know that it really to grab and grasp like that feels very uncomfortable. And this impulse, I think, is responsible for so much injustice and inequality in our world Uh, on a personal level, the discomfort of, of worry and anxiety. I'm hearing a lot uh, right now about how uh, millennials and Gen Gen Z are the anxious generation. And so Jesus speaks into that condition for us. Um, We, I believe we have a choice. We can either live in that closed handed white knuckle desperation or anxiousness or we could make the pivot to acknowledge God's care and presence and abundance and to open our hands to receive what we need with gratitude, to ask, seek, and knock for the things that we feel like we lack, and then to learn to live with a sense of generosity and interdependence interdependence with others. And so there's a few little bits in the Sermon on the Mount that sort of speak to this. Jesus saying, do not be anxious or do not worry uh, ab- about your life. And in other parts of the Sermon on the Mount, talking about being oh, generous, you know, I, like materially generous as well. So that's a really key, I think, fundamental pivot. Can Will I be willing to open my hands and trust that this is a safe universe to live in, that I am cared for? And that I don't have to hold on so tightly. You, you said you, you've studied psychology and, and all these kind of things. My number one uh, piece of advice to people is get out of yourself and start caring about the things around you. And mm-hmm. you'll, you'll find healing. <laughs> do, you, do you agree yeah. with that? Yeah. Well, and I think gratitude's a big part of the, uh, the first step is appreciating what what have I received, you know, helps ground you in God's care. And, but sometimes anxiety actually arises from the body, uh, not just in the mind. We'll feel anxious and then we'll look for a reason to be anxious, right? And I think that there's some tools that can, that can help us, you know, um, meditating on, on truth that affirms God's care for you is a really powerful tool for doing that in those moments of anxiety, taking a deep breath and, and remembering uh, what's true. Uh, I know for me, I've been pretty anxious during the 
the last 18 or 20 months of this pandemic, you know, it's been a particularly challenging time for you, you a have, lot of I us. Haven't, I haven't. None of us have. You're about to. Yeah. Know. Okay. I know I'm weird in that yeah, way, but uh, strange. <laughs> I, you know, they they say that uh, our minds tend to focus on regrets about the past or anxieties about the future, but God lives with us here in this moment, and if we can learn to acknowledge God's presence with us here in the moment. It can really bring us a sense of peace and rest that uh, it sometimes is challenging. So I wrote this little um, kind of uh, prayer to help me ground me in, and it goes something like this. God, my life is in you. I receive this moment as a gift. All that has been what lies a- and what lies ahead remain a mystery to me, kept hidden. But I trust in the love that spoke this world into existence. I say yes to whatever this day may bring. Only let me see and cherish what is real. And um, yes, I found that affirming those things really helps calm me down in those moments where I'm, I'm feeling anxious. The other thing we encourage people to do um, and that is recommended in my book is sometimes taking a radical, doing a radical act of generosity actually helps you get over your anxiety. You know, it, it, it arrests that kind of closed handedness. And years ago, and I wrote about this in my book, Practicing the Way of Jesus, I was part of a group where we challenged each other to take seriously that place in uh, Luke 12, where Jesus said, sell your possessions and give to the poor. And he didn't just say it to a rich young ruler that was in another place, but he, he gave it as a general instruction. And so a group of us took on the challenge of trying to sell or give away half of our possessions so that we could use those resources to give towards um, global development. And it was such a powerful exercise for all of us to realize the kinds of attachments that we had to our material possessions and uh, recognize some of the false scripts that we've gotten from our culture about what what well being is that's based on on money and and uh, possessions and it really it really freed us up in some amazing ways um, and so in the book I say I invite people to say what's uh, what what's more precious to you time or money and um, challenge readers to uh, give away some time or to give away uh, material possession or some money. Um, in order to to live in the flow of God's abundance. Paul uh, gives uh, praise to the Macedonians in, for, in what, 2 Corinthians? And he says, you know, out of their poverty, they gave. Yeah, and wow. It's like, what's going on here? Why would they do that? It's supposed to be the other way around, right? And it's like, what is going on is, is they are poor, but they are giving. So therefore, what are they? They're actually rich. Yeah, it's it's it flips everything upside down again. Yeah, fascinating. So, Mark, I'd also like to talk about verse five. Uh, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The values held in esteem by today's, you know, American, more broadly speaking, Western culture seem to be anything but meek. You know, <laughs> we're told that we need self confidence. Uh, we need to radically love ourselves. You know choose ourselves first. Don't feel bad about that. We should never let other people take advantage of us. We should always be vigilant because mm-hmm. everyone's out there and they're going to take advantage of us. There's winners and losers. You want to be a winner, you know? Mm-hmm. Why are people who are meek blessed by Jesus? Yeah. I think unfortunately in English, meekness sounds like weakness. And so it, I think it puts us in a different direction than what, uh, what, that, uh, what that really means. Something you've already alluded to there, Brendan, is I think we have a first instinct towards comparisons and competition. And we started doing this when we were really small. Who's the tallest, the best in reading, the best in math, the best in sports? Um, And we get into this math of asking, am I greater than or less than you? So we notice these distinctions and not only notice them, but then Uh, put a ranking to them. It's better to be in the top reading group. It's better to run faster. It's better to be taller. And if I'm not, then I'm less than. I think that kind of comparison thinking ends up being exhausting. And some of of us strive 
to be the best to be on top. And others of us sense that we're not going to be able to do it. And we sort of, you know, give up and think and, and kind of assume the lower position. All of that presumes that who we are um, or is based on something that we can construct and that these external qualities uh, in comparison to others are what makes us valuable. And I think what we see in the teachings of Jesus is a theme and, and throughout the scriptures is a theme that value and worth are inherent. We're made in the image of God. You know, we're called beloved and that we have value and worth uh, because of that, that's unearned. And my sense is if we can affirm that inherent dignity and worth, then we're much more able to and empowered to affirm that dignity and worth in others. And, and, and until we're able to do that, we're going to, we're probably going to get stuck in that either thinking we're greater than, or we're thinking that we're less than. And there's a really, um, and I'll, I'll just admit, I'm I'm an expert at these sort of comparisons, and I feel like I'm I can be kind of schizophrenic about it. Like one moment, um, you know, I'm I'm feeling better than because of you know because of some when I compare myself to some people, and um, and, and on the same thing in another moment, I won't. Like I did a retreat this weekend, and I generally think I'm in pretty good shape for a man of my age, and then the the uh, leader of the church that where I was doing the retreat, he is like a gym rat and he's even older than I am, but makes me look really out of shape. So I, I go from feeling better than to less than in like a nanosecond there, right? There's a story from the gospels that, that often is used to talk about humility, but I think we misunderstand it sometimes. And this, it's the story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples we often look at that story and go, wow, the great rabbi humbling himself to wash the feet of his disciples. And I think the main point of the story is that Jesus' disciples were stuck in this hierarchical thinking, thinking that they're less than. Jesus is up here and they're down here. And Jesus, I think, was trying to communicate, I don't see you as less than. You know, I'm connected to the Trinity. You can be connected to me. And, and the Trinity. And so I want to honor who you really are by washing your feet. And Jesus had the flexibility to either wash feet or to let other people wash his feet instead of always assuming a, a higher or a, a lower status position. And so um, one of the practices that I do in the labs that I lead and that I mentioned in the book is kind of asking the question, which is harder for you? asking for help or giving help and honor to others. And for a lot of us, it's actually easier to be the, be the helper. It's actually a, a higher position. It's a position of power and it makes us more vulnerable to be the person who, who needs to ask for help. And Jesus often put himself in that situation. He sits down at the well in John four and invites and, and says to a, a woman at the well, I, I need some water. Could you give me some water? Right. And when we try and live independently, always being self-sufficient, it actually prevents us from the kind of deep connections and community that we long for. And I know when somebody asks, when somebody asks me for help, I love to help because it means I, I have a role, but I've rare, I rarely or I hesitate to ask others for help because of this sort of sense of self-sufficiency that I have. I know you're probably aware of the some of the critique of even Christian charity recently. There's a book called When Helping Hurts that gets at sometimes, sometimes being in that superior role of serving actually disempowers the people that we're trying to help. Coming at it from a, a uh, um, angle of more equality is actually more dignifying than that superior helping position. Hey, this is Bob Robinson. Thanks for listening to the Reintegrate podcast. Reintegrate is my ministry to college students and marketplace leaders and church leaders, helping Christians to reintegrate their faith with every aspect of life, especially their callings. For the latest articles, uh, for online resources, for a small group Bible study resource, reintegrate your vacation with God's mission, go to the reintegrate webpage 
That is re-integrate.org. Remember the dash. I'd like to discuss uh, Matthew 5, 9 and 10 together. So that's blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. So this Jesus obviously hasn't seen any good movies. Taken, Kill Bill, Gladiator, <laughs> John Wick. Don't mess with John Wick's dog, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so on a, on a serious note, my wife takes what you just said about, about uh, when helping hurts. And she's been working with in Haiti. She first started going down there and doing, she's a physical therapist and doing physical therapy. And after a while, she's like, am I helping or am I hurting? Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm constantly coming down here for two weeks and or one week, and that's all. When I come back, they're like, oh, so excited that I'm here. So a few years ago, uh, there was a bunch of physical therapists who decided to start their, the first indigenous physical therapy, occupational therapy school in Haiti. So she, she started teaching Haitians, indigenous people, how to be physical therapists. And so she's now seen graduating classes this last uh, earthquake, you know, his, her students were taken off out to the, those areas of the, of the brokenness and helping. And so, you know, we have a heart for Haiti and we all were shocked by the news of the 17 missionaries and family members at Christian Aid Ministries mm. that were kidnapped in Haiti on October 16th. Now, CAM's headquarters are not far from where Brendan and I are here in, in Ohio. Mm. So I know people who staunchly claim that they're Christians who want to violently respond to this kidnapping, Mm. you know, it's Mm -hmm. like, let's go in there and just destroy these people for kidnapping these poor uh, Amish and Mennonite uh, missionaries, but they're Amish and Mennonites, right? Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) And they live by a rule of nonviolence. Listen to what they, I'm going to read this from their, what they wrote on their website. Join us in prayer that God's grace would sustain the men, women, and children who are being held hostage. In a world where violence and force are seen as the solution to problems, we believe in God's call to Christians to not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Pray that those being held hostage could find strength to demonstrate God's love. The kidnappers, like all people, are created in the image of God and can be changed if they turn to him. While we desire the safe release of our workers, we also desire that the kidnappers be transformed by the love of Jesus, the only true source of peace, joy, and forgiveness. What do you think of that, Mark? Yeah, Bob, that's that's beautiful. Those Beatitudes you mentioned, uh, and further on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus really really speaks about that kind of nonviolent reaction to being treated unjustly. If someone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let them have your cloak as well. Uh, Do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. And I call the, I call these beatitudes like sort of the PhD level beatitudes. Like, like we've got to learn to walk with God in some of these earlier beatitude realities before we're ready to, to engage with, um, with nonviolence. But um, we have to, like there's an order almost to the Beatitudes. There could be, yeah, I, I think kind of, I think, I think maybe these later ones. Yeah. First you need to learn to trust God, your life to God. Then you need to mourn with God about what's broken in the world. Then understand your inherent dignity and worth and live out of that. Then understand your agency and power, right. To be, to be a person who seeks uh, God's kingdom, uh, righteousness and justice. And I think I think what this beatitude challenges is that first instinct we have towards retaliation. And I think about it for myself. Um, while I was writing this book, I was on a trip with my wife in the Midwest, and we were walking across the street at, at a stoplight. We had the right of way, and a and a car that had like a souped up engine and was playing loud music was revving its engine, and jerked into the intersection while we were walking across and I quick pushed my wife out of the way. And I looked back and this person in the car was pointing at me and laughing. Like they'd intentionally let the car lurch forward in order to scare me. And immediately I wanted to 
I thought about some choice words. I wanted to throw a brick through the front shield, windshield of the, of the car. That's sort of our natural reaction to being mistreated. With this beatitude and the other instructions in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is inviting us not to feed into that desire for retaliation. And uh, Bob, I appreciated what you had to say about some of the our action movies, right? Because we love re- stories of redemptive violence where things where you know so things are made right through violence and, and the bad guy gets what he deserves and the good guy wins but i think the kingdom of god is a bit more complex than that so why would jesus tell us uh, to, to to take that nonviolent position um i i think one of the reasons is that um when when evil is done to us and we return evil for evil we perpetuate the evil that's in the world. And so by, instead of reacting uh, with retribution, we surrender to suffering. We break the cycle, you know, we, and we join the cosmic struggle of good and evil in the world. And in the end, love will finally win. But I think to do that also, uh, we have to have a, a sense that God is with us and can meet us in that suffering that we experience because we've taken that, made that choice as well. I should also add, um, this is a particularly challenging beatitude for people who have been on the underside of power. And for someone who's a victim of domestic violence or trauma or an abusive relationship or someone who, because of their, their identity or um, skin color, have been trampled on. It feels kind of it, it feels especially counterintuitive to take that nonviolent route instead. And I think we have we have models for this, like uh, Rosa Parks or uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who exercised a certain amount of strength and resiliency, uh, standing their ground, but not resorting to violence in the face of evil. And there's a lot that we can learn from their example. Not every day is this exciting, but I was, I was at the, uh, I try and use the Beatitudes to set my intentions each day. And I go, how, what, how, what's, how's God inviting me to trust? How, what's God inviting me to mourn? Um, am I stuck in competition or in comparison, or am I affirming my own dignity and worth and the dignity and worth of others uh, and go through the, all the Beatitudes that way. And, uh, as you probably noticed in the book, there's postures for each of them, uh, each each of those beatitude invitations. And so often I'll go for a short walk in the morning and I'll put my body in those postures as a way of praying the, the beatitudes. So I had done that one day and I went to the pharmacist to pick up a prescription. And while I was waiting, the guy next to me pulled out a gun from his backpack and started sort of pointing it around the room. And I live in an urban area. So a lot of people can get hurt if there's a gun pulled like this. And, and I immediately thought, what is the, what is the right and good thing to do here? And first I thought, Mark, you don't have to be afraid. Life comes after life, you know, follow that way of radical love. Don't be afraid. And then I thought, uh, Mark, you know, follow that way of nonviolence and uh, peacemaking. Maybe, maybe there's a calm way to, to go about this. So I just turned to the gentleman and I said, Hey, what kind of gun is that there? And he mumbled something. And I said, well, well, friend, I, I think you might want to put it away because if the security guard sees you, they may call the police and you might not get out of your the store without, with, without some harm coming to you. And he quietly put it back in his bag without incident. And I went up and told the pharmacist uh, what had happened and just to be on the lookout in case he decided to pull it out again, but he left without incident. And I credit my, res- my, my kind of deescalating response there to the work that I'd been able to do with the Beatitudes over the last few years. Yeah, that's funny. That's a crazy story for me to hear because, uh, so I'm actually a seminary student right now. I'm, you know, working in a, a intern position at my church as well, but to pay my bills, I work at a gun store 
And <laughs> oh, this is interesting. I, yeah. And so I, I mean, at the gun store, you know, as part of how we try to keep things, you know, secure, I carry a gun on my hip every day at work. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think about that a lot because, you know, I'm, I carry a lethal weapon with me. I think about that. Like here I am carrying this thing with the expectation that if I had to, I know how to use it and that I would, you know, but, and then I first ask myself, like, what, what situations would I, Yeah. you know, what would justify this? Not just legally speaking, because what, like, what are the contexts where I would shoot someone and, you know, I would still be morally justified. Are there any, right? The Mennonites, the Amish would say no. Or even if you were morally justified, would you rather risk being potentially harmed or live with the weight of taking someone else's life? Right. Oh, I, I had a conversation. (laughs) I had a conversation several years ago with another Christian actually. uh, And we were talking about concealed carry and I have my concealed carry license, but I very rarely carry because I don't think most of the situations I I would be in a situation would be worth it for me to use, you know? And I had a, I had a conversation with someone about that. I was like, you know, if I was getting robbed and it was just me and the guy wants my wallet, I'd probably just give him my wallet. Mm-hmm. Cause at the end of the day, me shooting him in that context would be, you know, that equation is me saying, you know, my wallet's worth more than your life. Yeah. You know, uh, part of one of the things you mentioned is like the, uh, the myth of redemptive violence. And I think that's something that's, um, you know, we were talking about that with violent movies that Bob cited. That's like so prevalent in our culture. That's so prevalent in my mind. I think that way. You know? Yeah. I think one thing that the Beatitudes invite us to face are these primary negative emotions like when I, if I listen long enough, I'll, I'll say it sounds like underneath your desire for these rights, it has something to do with fear. I'm hearing a lot of fear coming up inside of you and the gospel calls us to something greater than fear. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Could you and I trust that Nothing can separate us from what is most essential to our well-being, not even violence and death, you know, and, and to live from that hope and life after life, rather than this, the fearfulness that comes from thinking of ourselves as a small, separated self. Um, that's why I like to think of the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount sort of as um, Jesus' manifesto for a whole new way of, of being and doing. And um, Brendan, what you brought up kind of gets at this, that, that uh, I like to say it, they, that the Sermon on the Mount invites us into a higher consciousness or the higher consciousness of the kingdom of God, instead of that small, that small separated way of seeing, um, see things from a more expanded and accurate view of life. Ultimately, all nine Beatitudes are, you know, when you take them all together, Altogether, it's a completely countercultural way of living. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you look at our culture right now. Yeah. Our culture is centered around, you know, dominance and aggression and competition. Uh, it's centered around image. Yeah. It's centered around rightness, proving your rightness. I think having uh, maybe another to add is feeling like it's okay to have contempt towards people. Yeah. Judging oh, yeah. them. <laughs> Righteous hatred. Yeah. Our culture is full of righteous hatred coming from every direction. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Beatitudes kind of turn that all on, on its head. Yeah. What a lot of times when people get this picture, like of the countercultural nature of the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, um, they'll say something like that's a hard way, or that's, that's like for really serious people, or that's hardcore. And my response would be actually the, the lives we're living out of that low level consciousness and those first instincts, that's the hard life. Jesus, Jesus said that his way was easy and his yoke is light. So uh, one way I like to look at it is if we could learn to see the world ourselves and who God is in the same way that Jesus did, then we would find living out the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount easy to do. They, it would all make sense to us if we could live from that, um, that higher s- state of awareness. And I, I think if, if anything else, you could boil it down to what the gospel is saying to us in the present moment is you are safe, you are powerful, 
and you are loved. You're not small, separate, and and without w- without resources, you know. Um, and if we could if we can internalize that message, it really frees up us up to live and love in radical ways. And that's what the journey of discipleship or spiritual formation is about: is leaving these false scripts, these these low level consciousness, to embrace the deeper reality of the kingdom of God. Yeah, a friend of mine said, you know, these beatitudes, they don't really work in real time. And I'm like, <laughs> they don't, because our real time reaction is, are those first reactions that you go through in the book. Yeah. Like in real time, we do these things all the time. And that's what we're trained to do. What Jesus is asking us to do is stop those real time, first time uh, reactions and to go deeper and try to live a different life. Mm-hmm. I think you can, and I think you can train to have new reactions, you know, um, like that's what spiritual disciplines are meant to do is to arrest our normal reactions. One that's been pretty powerful for people in the labs that I lead is, is related to the beatitude. uh, I call it the way of compassion where Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. So we'll, I'll invite a group to say, um, let's make a commitment for the next seven days not to not to judge anyone, not to say anything critical or disparaging about any other human being or ourselves. And mo- for most people, it's a big challenge to go seven days with, <laughs> without having contempt and criticism. And, and just making that commitment, I suddenly become aware or more aware of how often I speak in contemptuous and judgmental ways. And so um, that, that awareness can help me make new choices. Uh, I know that on the weeks when I've done this experiment, I have a lot more joy than on my normal weeks where, <laughs> where I'm giving myself permission to be content, you know, contemptuous. So well, thanks for joining us, Mark. We have had a great time. And yeah, it's, it's great to be on. And if you want to check out some of my other work, it's at markscandret.com or ninefoldpath.org. Great to be with you both. Yep. Great to have you here. All right. Peace.